uh, people will die. It's not if, it's about how many. And that's why I'm so passionate about Bitcoin, but because I mathematically proven and through my experiences, I 100% know that Bitcoin will save lives. Once you learn fast uh, uh, about life and you practice uh, what you learn, uh, you go through life figuring out that you can realize your potential much faster than people tell you. Learn more about Bitcoin. Believe me, if you think you know, go deeper. I'm constantly learning. I, I think that I'll never stop learning about Bitcoin. Hello, Ivan. How's it going? Hello. It's going very nice. How about on your side? Uh, it's also very good. For, um, for anyone who doesn't know, Ivan used to be a professional national foosball player. Um, <laughs> but he now works at a lightning company called Breeze. Um, and so, Ivan, yeah, would you would you kind of give us a little bit about your background and then kind of your journey into Bitcoin and how you ended up working at a company like Breeze? Okay, so my background, uh, depending how far you want to take it, I was raised by my grandma my first seven years in a village, but uh, through uh, school, through high school, uh, and uh, later university, I uh, studied uh, mainly mathematics. Uh, was very intriguing to me through my uh, grandparents who were teachers uh, of mathematics. My mother uh, created a business uh, of uh, civil engineering, and I was supposed to inherit uh, that business. Uh, and uh, in high school. I studied for civil engineering in uh, university. I applied only for that uh, specialty. But uh, after four years, I quit university and I said to my parents, I'm going to be independent <laughs> and uh, I want to take care of myself. And I didn't like uh, my father. We were, yeah, so from 21 years old, I was completely independent, started working in McDonald's. Uh, back then, but uh, quickly, once you learn fast uh, uh, about life and you practice uh, what you learn, uh, you go through life figuring out that you can realize your potential much faster than people tell you and what's the right way or the or you have to study or so whatever, you have a job or whatever. But uh, that's uh, kind of my personal journey. Uh, and uh, in that personal journey, in uh, 2013, I managed to make a partnership with somebody. So we created a, a web game, that's a strategy game. But uh, in 2014, because my mother uh, figured out that I'm not going to inherit uh, her business and uh, she wanted to shut down a lot of things, and uh, the person next to her, my father, the things there increasingly got worse and worse and worse until the moment where in 2014 and she wanted to divorce him and uh, he said, okay, so I'm not going to have any income because he was not working and he decided to kidnap and kill her. So in 2014, I be uh, became the parents of my sister. I have a smaller sister, uh, 11 years uh, is our difference. But uh, because of those circumstances, I heard about Bitcoin in 2013-ish. Uh, but uh, in 2014, you can imagine a lot of things I needed to figure out. Uh, so then I wasn't even thinking about Bitcoin. But in 2019, uh, when I met my girlfriend back then, she bought one Ethereum and uh, she was booking me, okay, learn about this so we can make some money. And uh, uh, I was like, uh, I don't want to learn about this. Uh, I worked for for these companies and this is just uh, scamming people uh, through cryptocurrencies. But uh, in 2021, a uh, close friend returned the money that he owed me and uh, 
then I asked him, how are you able to do that? Uh, I wasn't expecting that money to be returned. And he said, oh, I, I'm involved in some crypto tokens and uh, everything is up. So uh, here it is, your money. And then I decided, okay, I'm going to learn about this. And I closed myself in a room for 10 days straight and listening to podcasts, figuring out uh, different articles and things like that. And uh, 10 hours, 16 hour, uh, 10 days, 16 hours straight a day, just eating and learning, <laughs> you quickly figure out that uh, it's Bitcoin and everything else is just so something imaginary. But I'll leave it here and a lot of things uh, could be taken the conversation. So I leave that to you. Wow. Yeah, an, an unbelievable amount of things that I would like to dig into and maybe will dig into. But I yeah. kind of the one of the toughest things I, which I want to kind of touch into, which is that 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 occurrence, the, the tragedy with your mother sounds unbelievably tough. I mean, how was it like, how did you get through that time in 2013? Because obviously you not only have to think about yourself, you have to start looking after your sister as well. And you obviously probably felt a huge amount of anger towards this man and kind of like, why is life like this? And I mean, I'd love to kind of know how you, what it felt like and how you managed to get through that period. Well, uh, logistically, the first thing that uh, I had to do is close the partnerships that uh, we were developing the game. We developed the game. Everybody told me it will take you two years and 20 people. We managed to make the first version of the game in six months with seven people. Uh, but uh, And we were just uh, going to distributors and trying to make the deal. But just before uh, we signed that type of a deal and find uh, the distribution platforms, uh, this thing happened. And uh, what I decided then, okay, I will find work for the employees, uh, so I know that they are taken care of, but I had to close that uh, partnership down um, because uh, I had to take care of my sister. I had to go uh, for lawyers, uh, all sorts of other things developed in the whole process. But uh, the way that uh, that event shaped me is, uh, I realized two important things. In life, absolutely everything, um, it's kind of perishable. Uh, and what I mean about this, everything that you build, uh, you will not be able uh, to take it with you. Uh, you will not be able to build something that lasts uh, uh, centuries. Uh, it, back uh, in the, let's say, thousand years ago, people started to build cathedrals and physical stuff that could uh, be thousand, uh, centuries. But uh, these days, uh, absolutely no. I didn't know that the money was the problem uh, for this uh, back then. But the only thing that could last is your legacy. And your most important legacy is your kids. That was my view. And in order to preserve the legacy of my mother, the only thing that I had to take care of is me and my sister. So I could uh, give her the skills so we could be self-sustained. Uh, we could develop resourcefulness so we can have the life that we want. And uh, in that situation, it's not only that uh, the killing occurred, but even after the killing, I would say 99% of the assets that uh, my mother accumulated were stolen by my father, even not only by my father, but a lot of entities uh, after her death. So he stole some apartments that we were supposed to inherit. Uh, I figured out that uh, everything that she bought because they were married, uh, everything that she paid for, he owned. 50% uh, of those assets because of the marriage. That's the law in Bulgaria. And because of all those things that occurred and uh, you realize this uh, little by little, little by little, how the whole system is set up, I understood, okay, the legacy is the kids, but uh, I one of the most important things for your legacy for the kids is to really know what you're signing once you are married. I, and I bet that in different countries, the laws are different. 
uh, but that implicates hugely what are you going to live because when you live your will, it's not your will. It's what the state allows the, uh, your will to be. And even though my mother had uh, a will, what she wanted to do, it turns out that the state says, no, you can't. Uh, because somebody decided this is the proper way. And uh, uh, when I figured out uh, in 2021 Bitcoin what it is, I figured out that Bitcoin is the only thing that uh, you can uh, execute your will 100% the way that you want it to be uh, about Bitcoin. And everything else, uh, even uh, if you leave, let's say, a business or a, a building to your kids, if they are small, they don't know how to manage it. And because they're incompetent, they're going to destroy your good efforts. And uh, uh, either somebody is going to come and uh, screw them over or just take the advantage because they are weak. Uh, all sorts of things happen and it's uh, c completely... Uh, I would say exposed, especially when the kids are small. Uh, I uh, was kind of lucky because I got out of my parent situation for 10 years and for nine years I was studying self-development and all sorts of things. So, and I kind of had the skills uh, to take care of myself. But when you introduce uh, a kid into the picture, your view changes uh, what's important. And, uh, uh, yeah, uh, it was hard, but uh, even though it was uh, kind of harsh, uh, but uh, you have to separate your logical self from your emotional self. Even though you're hugely affected, uh, the way that I was thinking about back then, um, because the responsibility was kind of on my shoulders, even though relatives tried to help, uh, I needed to make the decisions. And I said, okay, either I'm going to uh, uh, cry all day and be uh, in suffering or whatever. But uh, the phrase that I was repeating to myself that life uh, is for the one that are living. And uh, I wanted to, uh, as I said, to preserve my mother's legacy, that it was not a wasted life of hers by giving an opportunity to me and my sister. Mm, that's such a, such a, such a powerful perspective, I'm sure, in your position to kind of see it as your own mission to one, look after yourself, to be happy, to live and do what you enjoy, and then do the same for your little sister in honor of her, instead of kind of, yeah, getting well, I guess completely stalling or being able, unable to get out of a kind of rut. Um, I want to kind of also come on to Bitcoin and the system, but first I want to revisit your 10 days, I think you said it was, um, of intense study, 16 hours a day, <laughs> yeah. and your kind of the progression of your learning through that. Because I think we all, ha we all go into the rabbit hole. We all go through different checkpoints. Some people stay someplace, others move on. So I'd love to hear your journey and why it is that you, for you personally, were like, it's just Bitcoin for me. Uh, okay. So in, I would say I'm class of 2022 uh, because it was really the Christmas vacation. So definitely the end of 21. But uh, I started with a few episodes in Impact Theory because crypto was kind of the rage uh, on the bull market uh, there. And uh, everybody that uh, was on the crypto topic in Impact Theory, he kind of had his own pass, podcast. So uh, Robert Breedlov uh, and his series, uh, Michael Saylor, uh, Pomp, Safe Dean, uh, who else? Uh, what Bitcoin did with Peter and Mark Ormark. And uh, it's just, uh, not only that I listen to 16 hours straight, but podcasts I listen to two and a half times speed. So the 100 hours that's minimum, I did in three days. And uh, because I have a very analytical mind, uh, 
uh, I mean, I can recognize emotions and I study psychology also, but uh, what excites me personally is mathematics. Uh, this is how I was raised. And when you start figuring out what Bitcoin really is, that Bitcoin is just uh, another thing that it's in universe that's absolutely proven by mathematics, just like, let's say, a building that is built. You can represent that with mathematics. Uh, you can uh, represent absolutely anything physical with mathematics. And for me, mathematics is the language, the universal language, how we interpret the universe. So we can uh, accurately understand what's ha uh, happening behind it. And when I was learning all those kinds of things, I would say the, uh, there are three big teams that really impacted me. Uh, and the first team is the Michael Seller engineering point of view that uh, really speaks to me, even though I'm a completely different type of engineering than him. But it's again, uh, engineering for me is applied mathematics in f physical reality. The other uh, thing is uh, Jason Lowry and his perspective on uh, power projection. And I really, uh, reassessed what work it is and now I understand what uh, it's not that I understand but I see the, uh, through this lens uh, that the physical work, things that are moving through time and space uh, and the word effort has a completely different meaning right now and the third uh, huge team is Jeff Booth and the implication on technology into the world so uh once you uh, get those three teams and with my personal uh, story, uh, figuring out that Bitcoin will fix the problems that are with inheritance, uh, I understood that nothing else uh, could be like this because I tried to prove it with some other crypto projects. Uh, I still went into some uh, crypto projects just to confirm it for myself. But... Uh, Oh, uh, either people are lying to you and they don't want uh, uh, you to know so you can deposit money or they are completely ignorant and they have no idea what they're building. And that's proven. Uh, I went into another blockchain, which is developing only games, and the blockchain is based on um, uh, POS, uh, proof of stack, uh, and uh, proof of uh, stake, uh, yeah. And uh, uh, on top of that, every single individual project is doing completely stupid uh, things about economics and they uh, think that the norm normal ROI for a company is 30 days to double your money. <laughs> and guess how much uh, every single project uh, had a bull market for? Uh, it had like three weeks and then it crashed. Uh, never there wasn't a single project that uh, was like that. I found one project that they're kind of building in the right way and I still track them because uh, I just want to know how they're going to crash. Because even though the project is nice, it's built on a swamp. And when the swamp <laughs> takes them whole, that whole blockchain doesn't matter uh, uh, what kind of a building you built on the swamp. It's still <laughs> going to be uh, worth nothing. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, with the personal story, with those teams figuring them out for um, themselves, and because I'm uh, kind of an engineer, I tried to disprove because I came with a huge bias towards Bitcoin. I thought that it was a scam and I thought everything was a scam. But I tried to prove to myself that I'm right and the other people are wrong. And once you go with that bias, trying to confirm and not just uh, be biased, but really use mathematics to confirm it and figure out game theory so you learn, you know a little bit about uh, human psychology. Uh, Bitcoin is designed, uh, I would say, uh, the absolute proper way on the first layer. And uh, if you think that the first layer is the technology, uh, and you see it as a technology, you think, oh, I need to improve it. It's just like saying uh, a human is a mammal. 
Yes, that's true, but that's incomplete information. Or let's say a human is a person that can think logically. Yes, that's true, but it's again such a co complex system, just like Bitcoin, in order to appreciate it, you need to connect it to everything because money, uh, the only thing that it will matter in a few decades is uh, Bitcoin is money, nothing else. And you need to design, because money touches everything, it's just designed in layers and it will reveal itself uh, more and more to the rest of the world. And again, uh, long format, but uh, I'll leave it here for now. <laughs> mm. I kind of, yeah, I think the first chapter of reading Bitcoin is Venice by Alan Farrington, my biggest takeaway was that no one understands Bitcoin because there's, there's so many aspects, as you say, on game theory, psychology, system design, all this kind of stuff, that to truly, as you, to understand it, it's almost, yeah, too, too mind-boggling to really think about. And I've kind of, yeah, my journey is sort of similar to you in that I started off crypto, I was like, this is awesome, more and more, and then I started going on to Linolden more, and you're kind of, your, your information source moves from, say, BitBoy, Martini Guy, to kind of more sophisticated taste and you kind of realize that like all these people who you really respect like Jack Mallers, Jack Dorsey like all they care about is Bitcoin and you then start to you question that and you also start to realize yeah a lot of this stuff like I'm not against it but when I think it's Jeff Booth who says ask why five times and I am, I'm always like it doesn't it feels kind of like it's built on quicksand now, I'm, I'm open to being wrong and I try and get people on with a different opinion onto this podcast um, to try and figure it out. But um, yeah, it's still kind of very much where I sit moment. I think one thing you hear as well is surely if Bitcoin, like the code is all out there, it can just be copied, um, which is one of the thing that people who don't really understand to say. And I'd love to hear what is your um, personal, what, how do you go about explaining to someone that Bitcoin is not something that can be replicated and it is actually completely unique to everything else? Uh Actually, I didn't have a chance to uh, prove that point that Bitcoin is the only one thing because people think that uh, uh, everything else is the same. But uh, I just uh, kind of explain uh, why uh, prices go up. And once you figure out what truly inflation is, then you figure out what the current system is. And once you figure out what the current system is, now you can compare Bitcoin and all the crypto things to it. And you figure out that crypto is just fiat with some code. <laughs> and uh, Bitcoin is just engineered to be uh, money and there is no single point of failure. And uh, uh, it's a long conversation, I would say, but uh, I don't try to separate Bitcoin from crypto. I try to separate that Bitcoin is the hardest ever money and compare it to what, what money is uh, in order to compare it to the other things. Uh, because if you get into uh, Bitcoin versus crypto, that assumes that those things are different from US dollars, euro and everything else. And it's uh, not really. Uh, crypto is the same as uh, US dollars in I would say a lot of ways. And Bitcoin is, uh, again, money, what we think money should be, but it's designed the way that we think it, it should. It's not the manipulation that happens with inflation, with taxes, and it just gives, uh, just like uh, Michael Seller has so many other metaphors that Bitcoin is property, Bitcoin is technology, Bitcoin is energy, Bitcoin is so many things. Just like I said, uh, such a complex system, just like a uh, human is not just a mammal, a human is not just uh, walking on two feet. Uh, so many aspects and all those are true, but in, in order to understand the complexity of it, you need to go separately and compare it. Let's say if you take Bitcoin is property. Now you compare it to other properties. If you say Bitcoin is money, you compare it to other money. Bitcoin is technology, you compare it to uh, other technologies and you have to do each one of those individually in order to understand why it's so much different. Because 
uh, just like I said, crypto is so uh, the same uh, with uh, US dollar and euro. Again, Bitcoin has a lot of common things with uh, Ethereum and uh, with uh, all those uh, proof of uh, stake and all those uh, other blockchains that you need to figure out really what's the difference. Uh, and Bitcoin is the only thing that you can compare in so many other variables than just uh, technology, uh, crypto, uh, graphic uh, money or whatever you decide. Mm. Fascinating answer. To kind of simplify that a bit, I guess, say if you were to compare Bitcoin to crypto, you're saying that is, that's, uh, it's too narrow-minded. You need to think of just a gradient of different monies and it's simply that Bitcoin, of all those monies, is the hardest money because of its supply dynamics. Um, and it's, yeah, no single point of failure. Instead of being so narrow and just being like Bitcoin crypto. Um, yeah, I, I, I like that way of thinking. Yeah, yeah oh. and uh, just to expand on that, uh, sorry, it's just, uh, it's not only about money, but in a way, uh, I think it's not going to manifest itself yet but Bitcoin will implicate culture. Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin uh, will implicate the way that we think because all those things will manifest much more. Because uh, on another podcast, I, I said, uh, if you think that Bitcoin is right now going up uh, its value in US dollars or how much you are going to be able to buy, it's again so much narrow thinking because let's say in Africa, they adopt the Bitcoin standard uh, much faster than the first world countries. They will never, uh, I think, they will never have the amount of Bitcoin that uh, a first world country would have. But because they're using this medium of exchange there, it will manifest so much physical things because they are not rolled by 100% of inflation. Now they can build the roads uh, in their countries. Now they can exchange between each other and they are not uh, shoot it and create wars and killed by machete by a particular groups or whatever it is. And uh, that, I would say, is the uh, second layer on the implication on humanity. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, another thing that Bit um, Bitcoin is, hope. And uh, I think Michael Saylor started that one also. But for me, Bitcoin is not hope. And for me, uh, when you realize what Bitcoin is, people feel hope. But once you realize, okay, I don't need to be hopeful, that this is going to consistently save my money, save my energy, everything else. Now you can build everything. And I would, uh, I would love to see that future because everything that you want to build, it will manifest with enough time because uh, they will not rob you this way. And uh, I had another point about this. It, uh, it is uh, Bitcoin. Uh, if I say right now to you, I hope that both of us finish this podcast. That means that there is a chance <laughs> that we won't, uh, one of us won't. And that is uh, what uh, right now uh, I'm thinking about Bitcoin. Because we are still comparing it to the fiat system, how uh, we are ingrained in it. And we compare all oh, people are stealing, increasing prices, all those uh, sorts of things. And you don't know where they're coming from, really, that it is inflation causing it. And you find Bitcoin and it gives you hope. But at some point, it will change again because Bitcoin is what it is. And we feel hope. But after hope, I would say is explosion of building things that last. Mm. Well, I mean, one of the most important aspects of being able to build, having a good economy is being able to successfully save your money, have security, knowing that that money is safe, that it won't be eroded at 100 percent, 200 percent of you, whatever, whatever. And it means that then you can take the risks to start a business, build things and kind of go from there. And I, this kind of brings me on to um, something you mentioned a while ago in the you said Bitcoin is the only way 
to truly for inheritance to be to truly um, be from the parent to the child. And I'd love you to kind of yeah riff on that a little bit and explain to me why that is the case and how you see that playing out. And say let's you can even do a case study of if you have a child. Um, how you would go about doing it? Yeah, uh, I'll tell you the story that I had to deal with with uh, my mother's case because we were supposed to execute her will and uh, what we encountered. First of all, uh, once uh, people know, okay, this person has a lot of uh, stuff uh, and she didn't, didn't have a lot of stuff, but because she had a business, he, she had stuff. Uh, she accumulated through her career. And uh, especially on the other side, when you have a psychopath and a criminal and around him there are other criminals, uh, the kids are exposed uh, in the fiat world because it's physical manifestation. Now they will try to use the laws and what the, even outside of the laws to manipulate things so they can extract uh, the assets that are supposed to be inherited by uh, the kids. For example, Two of the apartments that she had, we were supposed to inherit 50% uh, of those two apartments, me and my sister. But because it was in a company, uh, how they set it up, they said, okay, we are uh, doing a general assembly in the company, uh, in that uh, company uh, after my mother's death, it only it's only my father. And he decided, okay, we're not going to accept me and my sister in the company to inherit it. We kick you out. We inherit 100% of the company. Those two apartments are in the company and we sell it right away. And even though uh, we were supposed to inherit it, now you are going to the laws and you say, okay, uh, this is supposed to be mine and I want the money. And the state says, okay, then deposit a big bag of cash so you can even are allowed to sue this uh, person. <laughs> and because we didn't have uh, that cash, we didn't inherit the things yet, uh, he uh, took those uh, profits and uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, used, the, used it uh, for lots of stuff. And uh, in Bitcoin, uh, that's the beauty of it because you can start accumulating in your wallet and nobody uh, has to know how much is in it. Nobody uh, uh, has, I would say, uh, that low type of influence over you, what you are going to leave to who. So it's completely anonymous, uh, can be. And you just set up the way that uh, you want it to be uh, given to your heirs. And let's say you have three heirs and you say, okay, the one doesn't deserve nothing. The other one will uh, be 60%. The other one, I'll give him some, let's say 10% and the rest I give to charity. Or whatever you decide, even if you want to give them uh, equally, even if you want to die with the keys, it's absolutely 100% your choice but the only thing right now is you, uh, you're responsible to set it up. Uh, so uh, there isn't a particular company where it would say, uh, we'll give the coins to your heirs. That means that you're going to deposit the coins in some company. And I'm not a fan of that because if you deposit the coins in some company, that means that you're exposing the knowledge of the Bitcoin, how much is it, and it's going to somebody else. And let's say that transaction becomes public. Now the rest of the heirs could say, oh, you received, let's say, this amount. I'm entitled to whatever amount. And uh, even though they cannot forcibly take the Bitcoin uh, from the heir, he will sue them into the fiat system. And if he uh, wins that uh, court case, now you will be forced to give him the uh, fiat money. And if you don't pay the fiat money, then is another taxes or you go to jail or whatever. Or just because you received 100% of it and somebody is a psychopath like my father, they come and kill you also. So uh, that's not a situation. But because of the anonymity and uh, because of the absolute uh, uh, property rights uh, of Bitcoin, you can set it up the way that you want it to be. 
And that's why it was really attractive to me because uh, I was thinking that if that thing uh, was available and the whole thing is that now that I understand Bitcoin, I have to live with this because I heard about Bitcoin and uh, uh, around 2013, beginning of it. And if I figured it out, then my situation was not going to happen. Uh, my mother was going to still be alive. But uh, I would say because of the 2008 financial crisis, because things started to shrink more and more and that person didn't work, that was kind of the second order effect that we experienced. And I have no idea right now uh, the inflation that is coming next year and the uh, bankruptcies of banks and all sorts of chaos that's going to happen. What is going to reflect in somebody else's life that right now is struggling to live, let's say in Africa, there's uh, or somebody in human trafficking or whatever that uh, situation is for themselves, because uh, people will die. It's not if it's about how many. And that's why I'm so passionate about Bitcoin, but because I mathematically proven and through my experiences, I 100 percent know that Bitcoin will save lives and fiat will kill. Mm. That's pretty powerful. So you think that if, say, your mother held her wealth, not in those apartments, say, or kept it more anonymous in Bitcoin, um, that she would have been able to keep that more private from her partner and then maybe potentially have, um, have been able to survive and not, not have been attacked by him? Uh I wouldn't say it's a 100% guarantee uh, uh, about that, but the things that transpired even after the killing were not going to happen. It was going to execute the way that she wanted. And if she wanted and say, okay, my kids doesn't deserve anything, I'm perfectly fine with that. But because she had a will and that will uh, was not uh, executed that way that she wanted to be, uh, that is uh, the problem with it. But I bet because uh, Bitcoin could be uh, set aside, I don't know if uh, he was not going to kill her. But uh, uh, yeah, when it's physical stuff and people see uh, how much stuff uh, you have, and that's why I never tell how much Bitcoin you have uh, to public forums. But uh all of that uh, exposure to violence will decrease so much more. Mm. You touched on anonymity there as well. And one part, well, one criticism Bitcoin often gets is that although it's fairly anonymous, you can also track every transaction. But one thing where that's not the case is, say, on the Lightning Network, um, where you can be more anonymous, especially in sending payments. And yeah, I thought that would be a kind of a nice route for you to touch on your take on the Lightning Network, what's going on and how you have gone about understanding it as a second layer payment built on top of Bitcoin. Yeah, uh, for me, Lightning Network uh, tried to um, fix the problem of uh, the latency of the first layer in Bitcoin. And uh, also tried to solve the, uh, to decrease the fees, uh, I would say by a lot. But uh, because of that, I would like to, right now to just show to all the non-believers uh, how slow Bitcoin is. And let's say, uh, let's do uh, $1, 3,000 sats, I think something like 3, that. 3,000 sats on it now. Yeah. Let's see, amount. Cool. Cool. Okay. Okay. So, uh, but you clicked on a BTC address. You must click the Lightning Network. Ah, uh, yeah, my bad. <laughs> yeah. Second try. <laughs> Generate an invoice. There we go. Okay, it's uh, a bit blurry. 
Okay. Yeah, I'm trying Come to get on. focus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me my <laughs> yeah. No, come on, man. Come on, you had it. Oh, that looks pretty clear. Yeah. Okay. Approve on my side. Sending. Yep, it's just arrived. Yeah, nice. I just sent yeah, it. Nice. So, <laughs> seconds. Uh, for all the seconds. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so for all the. Uh, Proof of stack uh, or uh, Solana believers. <laughs> this is how uh, slow Bitcoin is. And for all the people that are in the fiat system, I want you to try to send in seconds from Bulgaria to where, uh, which? Wait, I'm in uh, Wales. Yeah, <laughs> in so in Wales. In Wales. Yeah, to send one dollar, and uh, the fee for one dollar is less than a penny. <laughs> So uh, for people, just a fun thing. So lightning. No, uh, so yeah, I mean, just just uh. touching on that quickly as well. I think that is. I think people forget that. So we've done that without a bank in the middle or without PayPal in the yeah. middle. It's gone through a network where no one's in control. And I think when people are like, "Oh, Bitcoin's a fad," or "Bitcoin's just like," it doesn't really matter whether you think it's a fad or not. It's more that something that was impossible before. It would have been impossible before for us to do that in seconds. There's no other technology that existed before. And all of a sudden, something does exist where you can do that. And it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. It's just the fact that it's almost like send, being able to send it, yeah. uh, being able to make a phone call when before you had to make a letter. It's just something that can now happen. And what the long-term implications of that are, who, who knows? But um, it just gives huge power to people like you and me to be able to almost give cash in hand because that's basically what you've done. Yeah. You've, you've given, you've put your hand through the screen and you give me a penny without having to go through the banks, which you can't do in the fiat system. Um, but yeah, with that, please, please carry on with whatever you're going to say. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, just to add on top of it, uh, like you touched, I didn't have to ask my government to send it. You didn't have to ask your government to receive it. Uh, I didn't have to ask my bank. You didn't have to ask your bank. I uh, didn't pay any fees to a payment processing company uh, like Visa or Mastercard, just like you didn't. But the only penny that I paid for the transaction is actually distributed to all the people that are maintaining their network. And it's not just one entity, but to the whole network uh, that is processing uh, the fees. And... Uh, by the way, uh, for the people listening, I am in a different application. So I'm in Breeze, uh, being loyal <laughs> to my brand, but uh, <laughs> I'm in Breeze and uh, you're in another application, uh, Moon Wallet, right? Moon, yeah. And uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, when every single application starts to receive uh, in this sort of way uh, money, uh, the economy will take a paradigm shift again because uh, I don't know if you experienced this uh, in Wales but in Bulgaria when uh, sites were built even though people started to order things to come to their house let's say you order shoes or clothes or uh, electronics whatever you uh, ordered on the internet people didn't uh, pay with the card uh, people just paid when it was delivered with cash really and wow yeah yeah, and uh, technologically, we didn't trust it, and uh, not a lot of sites were implementing it the correct way, and uh, that's why we paid cash. But now that all that economy uh, trusted uh, the, pay, uh, the cards, you just pay, and it's much, much uh, faster, and the economy is, uh, starts to grow, and that's why even Amazon is possible to be this virtual store because of that uh, ease of transactions. But just like that paradigm sh uh, shift happened there, now it's going to happen for every single app in your phone. It's going to receive sets like this. And uh, let's say you have five games that you're playing. What about uh, the game that you play? You are being monetized by uh, watching ads. But uh, just like, uh, shout out to Cinder, uh, now that you're watching uh, ads, you even receive Satoshis uh, for it. Now, 
I would say Thunder is the Trojan horse for every single other app that is advertising. So they're building their users uh, by the marketing budget of every single other <laughs> gaming company that is advertising to us. And so I, I love it. Like I would love to deplete uh, those fiat uh, money and I receive uh, even money for my enjoyment uh, when I wait at the uh, line and things like that. But Lightning uh, solved that and it's a network, but uh, because uh, it's still even uh, so much early about that uh, second layer, Breezy is taking on uh, the vision of Satoshi Nakamoto to um, Bitcoin from store of value to become medium of exchange. And he's thinking, how are we going to onboard 8 billion users? So the whole globe. And how are those 8 billion users are going to use, not only save Bitcoin, but just like us, uh, we exchange uh, some sats. This thing to happen so we use uh, Bitcoin in uh, our uh, services, in the products or whatever we would like to have. And uh, yeah, uh, the two huge things, I would say, uh, that Breeze is uh, already being vocal about it is first uh, build the SDK for mobile applications. So right now I think that software every single app... Software developer kit for anyone who... Software developer yeah. kit for anyone who's not sure what that is. Yeah. And uh, I would say the SDK is, uh, think like this, every single application on your phone right now is not connected to the Lightning Network. So in order to pay uh, the developers that are building that application, you have to pay with fiat. And all those problems that occur there with fees, with latency and with all sorts of stuff uh, are there. But all those benefits that we demonstrated in the podcast uh, can be implemented uh, with the SDK. So uh, you can stay focused on, let's say, uh, you're building an application for fitness in the home, let's say, <laughs> and you're building a subscription model. And right now you can build that application and add the SDK to it. Uh, we have one use case right now with uh, EV charging station uh, companies. So people can load their cars with Satoshis. And uh, uh, the, he even demonstrates it on screen that uh, the time that it takes to implement the SDK for that app was 10 seconds. <laughs> so the developers wouldn't have to learn, oh, what is the Lightning Network? Uh, how do I open channels? How do I provide liquidity? All that uh, things uh, can be uh, added also on top of the SDK with uh, the open um, Lightning service provider um, uh, module by uh, Breeze. Uh, not only Breeze, other companies are providing this, but we will take care of everything. So you can stay focused on building the application. And just like MasterCard uh, takes care of the transitioning and all those sorts of things, on the background, we will be the Lightning service uh, provider where we optimize the channel so you can pay less fees, uh, you can provide uh, the liquidity uh, uh, to the network. And uh, I would say the, uh, the LSP module is also uh, important because uh, with the SDK, you can transact, you can integrate it into the application, but with the uh, um, open LSP model is, let's say you're a company. Uh, let's say a micro, micro strategy uh, because people kind of know their numbers. Right now they have 130,000 uh, Bitcoin in their balance sheet and uh, it's in cold storage. Uh, I, I assume mo uh, most of it. But uh, that uh, Bitcoin uh, does not generate any yield. Uh, and that was the one marketing uh, bullshit that uh, cryptos... Uh, were deploying that uh, we're going to give you yield and they were doing inflation and thinking that that's yield. <laughs> no, that's, again, uh, USD in steroids. Uh, and uh, uh, going back to micro strategy, let's say that they decide, okay, I have 130,000 coins. 
I will set aside a thousand coins out of that so I can generate 2% yield. So because I'm providing a thousand coins into the Lightning Network, now on those thousand coins, I will, uh, because people will use them to transact between each other and for all those routing fees that Breeze will help, we'll split uh, the fees that are happening uh, through those channels. Uh, and uh, now on those thousand coins, let's say they generate 2% yield uh, a year. Uh, so that would mean they will generate 20 Bitcoin additionally to the thousand uh, Bitcoins that they are providing to the network. And the Lightning Network uh, has a 5,500 coins, something like that uh, currently. But imagine what would happen if uh, one company adds a thousand coins or a 500 coins. Now it's going exponential. And the more coins that become available into the network, the more transactions will happen. The more transactions, uh, that means that uh, they will be incentivized to uh, receive fees so they uh, have that yield. And uh, that will add again uh, more users with the SDK. So uh, that flyer will affect where uh, you have more users, they're transacting so you uh, receive uh, fees. So when you receive more fees, now you're incentivized not only to have cold storage, but to set aside a percentage of that cold storage so you can generate those Bitcoins. And the more liquidity into the network, again, uh, goes back to the users and one feeds on top of each other. And uh, that's, I would say, uh, the vision uh, for, I wouldn't say uh, the vision, but the strategy of how uh, to deploy the vision Bitcoin to become median of exchange. Again, I'm taking up lots of time for <laughs> this wow. uh, explanation, but yeah. So much to dig into once again. I wanna, there's a few things I wanna touch on, but the first is coming on to the idea of micropayments. So say with your Spotify or something like that, the reason why an artist can't just have their little wallet so that fans can send money is because obviously if they're fans from abroad or if they live in a country, there, are so, there is so much friction to get that payment across that it wouldn't be viable to send three quid, maybe a two pound tip, even a 50p or a two quid tip via the fiat system because it would cost more in fees to do that and it would take about seven days. So one of the potential cool use cases, if you have a medium exchange where you can send something for pennies um, instantly, then theoretically everyone on Spotify could have a little lightning wallet that if you're a fan, you could just quickly send over to, you could send over two quid, three quid, whatever you want without friction, um, which, yeah, yeah. It'd, be, it'd be exciting. And then the other thing which Jack Mallers is then working on is that you can use the Lightning Network to send the value, but the people on either end don't even have to hold Bitcoin. They just use Lightning yeah. Network as the messaging in order to send the value. Yeah, and that's the uh, extremely important point that uh, Breeze is also doing it in a non-custodial fashion. So when you provide the example that I said with MicroStrategy, a thousand coins, uh, Breeze is not taking hold of those thousand coins. We are just providing that uh, routing fees uh, to the net, um, to uh, the person that, or the entity that is providing the coins because they are putting in liquidity into the network. That means uh, right now uh, the Lightning Network, we don't know if we can send one whole Bitcoin on it. Uh, but uh, when people start adding uh, more and more coins into it, we'll be able to do it. And uh, yeah, uh, the more liquidity into the network uh, will be nice because uh, right now, in the bank, you have to deposit the money, you have to deposit the gold, you have to uh, make a contract so they have a claim on the apartment or the property. And for the first time with the Lightning Network, you're not giving the money to any other entity. And let's say you don't like this uh, Lightning service provider, you uh, take away uh, your coins and you say, I want another service provider. And the analogy that uh, we are using is Breeze is like an ISP provider. Right now, you're using an internet provider, and if you don't like their service, you say, okay, I'm not going to pay the subscription fee to you. I'm going to go to another one. And that's the same uh, application with the Lightning Network, where you just provide the coins, but it's your coins. They're not exposed at all. That is 
So cool. So what you're basically saying is that the fiat equivalent is that you could deposit your cash at a bank to earn yield, but not actually putting your cash in the bank. You're still kind of keeping it at home. It's still yours, but you're still able to earn the yield, except now you can potentially do that with Bitcoin is that you can not give it away. You can still keep it. There's no risk if, say, if Breeze went bankrupt, you would still own you, you would still own those coins. However, you can still earn a yield from it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, uh, and it's uh, uh, yeah, it you're connected to the whole network. Uh, those Lightning service providers, uh, uh, I would say, uh, not only for bankruptcy, that's an extreme case, but uh, let's say that uh, you like somebody else, or let's say they provide you a better uh, fee. Right now, the Lightning service providers uh, have to compete in the open market again, but we are not adding any new coins into the network, uh, which all the, uh, I don't know if all the 20,000 uh, shit coins do, but they are adding inflation into it. And inflation is not yield, but uh, when you provide that liquidity, uh, your coins are in your possession and at any point you can extract them and you put them in cold storage. But because of that incentive that you're going to generate yield, I don't think that people, let's say MicroStrategy again, uh, they'll put 130% uh, and 30,000 of their coins, so all of them. But because they don't generate yield, they will ask themselves, how much am I comfortable to not be in cold storage, but to be into the Lightning Network uh, so I can generate yield. And my assumption is that people will start, uh, uh, when I say people, I mean companies will start with uh, 100 coins. And even here, right now, if somebody adds 100 coins into the Lightning Network, uh, again, the growth will be exponential. Uh, so it took, I don't know, uh, five uh, years to grow to 5,500 coins. And in a month, let's say somebody decides to uh, execute uh, this type of model, in an instant, you can uh, almost double uh, the amount of liquidity into the network. Mm, that's crazy. Um, one thing you kind of touched on there is sort of the inflation of other coins. And I thought this would be an interesting topic because essentially, the reason why many of these cryptocurrencies over two cycles don't outcompete Bitcoin is that they tend to be more centralized in that their supply rules aren't hard coded in. So say, for example, with Bitcoin, there will only be 21 million ever at the end. And that that's something that can never change. Whereas with most of these other cryptos, it can change. So what they will often do as a growth tactic, especially early on, is say, hey, you can deposit in a farm, you can earn, say, 10, 20, as you say, some of them earn 1,000% yield. But all they're really doing is printing more of those coins and then giving them to you. So it feels like you're earning a yield. And when the markets are doing well and everyone's jumping in, it feels like you're making a lot of money. But what's actually happened is that the coins are just being diluted further and further and further whilst you think you're earning the yield. Um, so then to actually earn a real yield like this through your service, What's happening is you're depositing the coins, you're earning a yield, but there's no more coins being created in the network. You're earning the yield because you're doing work. You're helping, you're basically sacrificing your money to give liquidity to a network, to uh, the payments. Not network. sacrificing. Not providing. sacrificing. <laughs> you providing. You can't, you can't use them. Yeah. You can't almost use them once they're there. So for the time being, you're almost being like, okay, I'm going to store these here. I'm not going to use them. Um, uh, so that sounds... You can sounds use them in the Lightning yeah. Network. Yeah, uh, you can use them in the Lightning Network because uh, uh, they're set up in your own node. Uh, but uh, uh, again, let's say uh, MicroStrategy, because they're a software company and they provide software services, they uh, can say, okay, we're adding this liquidity so our customers, which are companies, can pay us with the Lightning Network. So we are going to increase the size of the network. So a bigger transaction can happen 
And uh, now not only that they adopt the Bitcoin standard, but they're incentivizing other companies to adopt it as well. Even though if they don't put it on the balance sheet, so uh, they will have to uh, buy Bitcoin and uh, let's say uh, do a subscription fee uh, to MicroStrategy. And this is kind of, again, a Trojan horse, but uh, there is an incentive for each single point because they're uh, doing uh, those uh, sorts of things. And uh, let's say that uh, uh, MicroStrategy says, okay, uh, I will spend uh, some Bitcoin because there's another company that is providing a service that we like uh, because the coins are there. You can spend them. It's your coin. <laughs> hmm. Mental. And so then... What are the kind of risks with this? Like say me and my family, we hold some. What would be the risks for us? Like, is this something that's readily available now? Could we do this with Breeze now? Or is this something more to come in the future? And if it is possible to do now, what are the risks um, with doing it? Yeah, I would say uh, currently we're, um, uh, people are reaching out. We don't uh, have a marketing strategy and we're, uh, want to work with uh, specific partners uh, to uh, do it. Uh, and uh, obviously you have to provide uh, the coins on the uh, uh, Lightning Network and you have to set up your own node, but uh, we can assist with that thing. But in order to deploy the SDK, obviously you have to have some type of a use case for uh, your users, how they will transact. Uh, because and, uh, because of this uh, vision, uh, Breeze integrated uh, POS uh, system into the application. And we have a podcast, yeah, point of sale. So merchants that uh, can't afford, let's say, uh, uh, payment processing uh, uh, for Visa, MasterCard and all the other things because it's uh, high fees. Um, now you can go to somebody that is selling bananas on the street. They download it uh, like uh, in their phone and they can set up, okay, my bananas cost this, uh, my pears cost this, my tomatoes are this. And you build the menu of the things that you are doing and Breeze is just uh, uh, facilitating uh, that uh, transaction and you can have the transactions viewed later on so you can do your personal balance sheet but uh, that's just one use case and when Breeze deployed the POS system uh, the transactions in uh, Breeze uh, grew 10x when uh, Breeze added, yeah when Breeze added another use case of a podcast player so uh, just like Fountain, when you upload there, people can stream your sets. Uh, that is integrated also in Breeze. So you can send sets to your favorite podcast in Breeze while listening to them. And when we did that uh, use case, we grew again 10x. Uh, so all those use cases for users, uh, People don't care about decentralization, the blockchain. They want to be able to spend their own money and to be able to receive uh, money in the, uh, by the things and not be charged obscene amount of uh, fees uh, from whenever. And uh, that is why the SDK, I would say, is the first thing that uh, is huge. Because uh, let's say right now on your phone, you have 50 apps. Uh, and let's say all the all those 50 apps uh, cumulatively are used by, let's say, 500 million people. If you deploy in one app uh, the SDK, uh, right away you're adding a million more users into the Lightning Network. Hey, they don't even know all oh, optimizing channels. I have to open this. All this it's taken care of um, by Breeze, and you just add it. And even the developers, it's such frictionless thing. You don't have to uh, think about that on your side. You just continue to develop the service that you're providing uh, so you can compete in the open market. Uh, because if we have to think, oh, now I have to learn about the Lightning Network and I can uh, have to learn about all that technology, 
uh, imagine right now you if you have to build the uh, hardware and the technology so you can have your own in, uh, internet <laughs> no it's much easier that you pay the fee and I want internet uh, this speed in my house and you pay the fee that is the uh, model uh, there with the SDK so yeah huge things uh, so definitely a lot of users will be added with each individual app, but as I said, uh, at no single point there's, a, uh, I would say, a risk. The only risk that you would have is yourself. Let's say that you uh, forget your keys, just like in Bitcoin. Like you have to have that personal responsibility. Uh, just like if I lose my money on the street. I don't blame the, the person that took it. <laughs> uh, it, it it's that uh, type of responsibility there. But the, there is, I would say this, that there is no counterparty risk when you engage uh, in the um, open LSP model or with the SDK. Hmm. And counterparty risk for anyone who's I'm not sure what that is. It's basically the risk that the party who say you're parking your money with fails and the money is no longer your money, as we've seen kind of with Silicon Valley Bank, um, although they yeah. have been bailed out. Um, okay, so... They still lost the money. Yeah, <laughs> they still, still lost the money. Lost and the money. everybody will... <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and that's the whole point, that if you don't expose so people are not even able to lose it. So only you're the person that uh, can lose them. But let's say that, actually, I, I didn't even think about that. Let's say that even you lose your keys, <laughs> the coins will still be in the network. So yeah, it's still benefiting uh, other people. So you're, you're providing that making, liquidity. You're just, you're, and you're just making yeah. it more scarce. <laughs> Um, you're making the Bitcoin more scarce in indirectly benefiting yeah. everyone else as well. Um, yeah. I want to kind of then pivot a little bit to Noster because I know it's, um, okay. it's, it's pretty clear on your Twitter profile. You're a big fan and most people, I mean, I, I haven't dabbled with it as much as I should have. Um, but I know this it's been, it's been quite an active space for a, for a fair few months now. And so I'd like you to kind of explain it to someone as if they know nothing about it and then touch yeah. on why, why it even matters. Yeah. Uh, I would say that uh, Noster is, uh, because it's built by Bitcoiners, they know uh, the price of centralization. And uh, because it's built by Bitcoiner, they're trying to build it in such a way that there isn't a centralized application like we are experiencing right now. And we are servants to the algorithms and uh, they can block you. But just like in the bank, you deposit your money there. Uh, right now, you're depositing your data into these data centers, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, uh, uh, Snapchat, whatever it is. And uh, we are servants to the algorithms and people that uh, want to grow in those platforms have to figure out what is the algorithm so I can understand how to grow. Because you can do something else and let's say uh, something that they don't like, you're blocked. Noster, I would say, are three important things in it uh, to get it. Now, there is clients, there is the protocol, and there is uh, relays. I would say the clients are all the application, uh, just like uh, the application, let's say, in the phone. Uh, there is the uh, protocol, which is Noster uh, itself, but those uh, messages are sent over multiple relays. So uh, I would say the relays are kind of the uh, hardware that the data is stored there. Uh, so you can send it to 15 uh, relays, 15 hardware system, and it's very cheap. So you can have your own relay in your home. So all the data is yours. And let's say that one client, let's say uh, Twitter decides to block it if they're on Noster, uh, to block you, your account. They don't block your data. Uh, so all those connections to other people are happening in the protocol level and they're distributed in these relays. 
And I would say, just to be easier, uh, I threw out, uh, uh, I would say, uh, technical things. But let's say that the top layer are the clients. And let's say we have uh, the future Twitter that is on Noster, we have Viber, we have uh, Facebook, we have, uh, let's say, Pinterest, and all those are different clients. On all the uh, things are happening in the layer, which is Noster, the protocol level. And uh, all that data is stored in multiple uh, thir third layer, I would say, in the hardware. So let's say you send one message from uh, Viber. If I send a message right now uh, to you, you have to have Viber and I have to be connected to you. But if we are connected in Noster, we're connected on the protocol level. And if I send a message from Viber, even if you have Twitter, you will receive it because let's say you you like the Twitter design better and the experience there. And also, uh, let's say that uh, in the future, Viber becomes obsolete and uh, let's say, uh, I don't like it anymore, but I like something that is developed in the future much better. Uh, again, open market. So I'm transferring to that new application, uh, uh, sorry, to that new uh, client and all the connections that I had in Viber are appearing in the new client that I'm using. So you are using 100% uh, of your data and you uh, have much more sensor censorship resistant uh, optionality is there. And uh, that's why it's uh, really exciting. And uh, I would say the biggest thing uh, where I think that it's going to drive uh, the adoption there is because in the network itself, you're coming with your Lightning wallet. So you're not only coming with your connections that you're building there, and let's say you're building uh, your uh, profile, but you're coming uh, with a Lightning wallet and right now uh, somebody posts something that you like. And let's say you put five minutes of this podcast in Noster. They can uh, directly in the clients themselves can send you sats for it. Uh, so that's huge. And not only in a particular client, but just like Viber can send you the message, I can send you on the sats from Viber with the message to your own wallet and you can receive uh, that thing. And let's say you build a um, uh, pretty uh, good podcast that people value. Now this is the true signal that it's not algorithmic, uh, algorithmic uh, uh, I would say slave by the algorithm of Twitter, how much it's going to be shown, but people will share it amongst themselves and they're going to send you actual physical, va uh, physical value uh, for it. And that's the true signal. Um, the likes, uh, I think, in the future, they might disappear uh, completely. Uh, but uh, currently, I just have to like it. And we know how many bots appear. Uh, and just to say, oh, I have uh, 100,000 followers. And uh, let's say two people are engaging in that uh, profile. But with this, even if you have two followers, if they like it, and I, just like I send you $1 over the uh, uh, this podcast over the video, that is streamlined extremely about uh, posts, about, uh, as I said, you can post the YouTube video there. Uh, you split it, uh, different sections, and this is the signal that uh, is the feedback for yourself. What people value in your podcast, and you say, oh, uh, people are sending me sets for this. It's not just likes, because uh, how valuable is uh, one like and how valuable is real money? Wow, you've you covered that fascinatingly. I mean, just to kind of recap all of that, essentially, you can have all of these clients, which are essentially your apps. So your Twitter, your Pinterest, your Facebook, your Instagram, and you can use, you can just have one account, which can be used in every single client. And you can, whichever client you join, you can still, you're still connected to all of your friends. So if you make a load of friends yeah. on Twitter and Twitter gets shut down, you don't suddenly lose those connections. You still have those connections. And on top of it, you can message each other 
no matter which app you're in because it all uses the same base layer. So if someone's in Twitter, they can send a message to someone who's in Instagram. And to go even further than that, if you want to send money, you don't need to go to a bank or get into your card details. You can send money from Twitter to Instagram if you find something that they found of value. I mean, that's yeah. that's mental. That's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, like uh, uh, just to clarify that you don't have to have right now uh, five apps. Let's say you don't have to have Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn and this and that. You just decide, okay, I'm going to communicate to the world through this brand because I like this client and uh, it's just broadcasted to everybody that is using their personal favorite client. So you don't have to have five clients but you may switch through different. I would say the only reason where you would have more clients is let's say that one client is optimized for video, one client is optimized for music, one client is optimized for tweets. Uh, that would be a reason to have multiple clients, but just to send messages themselves, it's distributed everywhere and you just uh, delete all the app, uh, all the clients, all the apps on the phone and you leave one. <laughs> And that's the one that you're using. And I forgot something as well there. So if we're kind of coming back to that idea, there's essentially, you can almost think about it as one theoretical database and all these other clients are just different ways of viewing the data, the messages kind of thing. But on top of it all, yeah. the data is not even stored with a central intermediary, like say Google um, or Twitter or something like that. You can actually be in total control of your data. So no one is selling your data, making money off it or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, uh, that is it. And because it's real, actual money in it, it's not uh, some virtual stuff and clicks and likes. Uh, what uh, Michael is, uh, I'm saying Michael Seller in this podcast. A lot. <laughs> yeah, a lot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, his idea about the orange uh, tag in Twitter, now it's available in uh, Nostop. Because Could you just elaborate he, on that for anyone who doesn't know what that, what the orange tag on Twitter was? Uh, yeah. He, his idea was in order to disincentivize uh, bots, uh, that means that it has to be costly to create bots and to spam uh, all the engagement friction. that's happening. Every, yeah. So uh, it's intentional friction and, again, uh, cost for the people that are doing it. Because if there is no responsibility and there is no cost in creating a million bots, why wouldn't you do it? And now your accounts are this much and you can even monetize all that or you can even attack uh, people with uh, messages or whatever you would like to destroy. Uh, if you go to a hotel and you destroy it and there is no uh, fee for you at the end of it, people don't care and the people that have that type of mentality I'll do it just for the heck of it or because I'm going to abuse the hotel or because they, uh, I don't like them or whatever. Uh, that is what's happening in uh, the applications now. But uh, his idea uh, was if you deposit some Satoshis because they're digital, uh, it's extremely easy and once you deal this type of damage, uh, or your code that you're about or whatever your rules are, now you lose that deposit and uh, people will be, will be very quickly disincentivized to use uh, bots, let's say. Uh, even if you do, let's say, uh, five cents uh, for a deposit, you will definitely not do 100 million bots. Uh, because that will cost you and not only cost you uh, the amount of money, but all those setting up the things and you'll quickly start lo losing it uh, with this behavior. In Oster, because you're coming with your actual wallet, that thing is actually uh, possible and people are doing it. In order to connect to let uh, what I said, the hardware there, uh, if you go to a, a relay that is paid, uh, you can deposit some Satoshis and they are uh, cleaning that data much more uh, because of this. And bots will not go into the paid relays because there's a physical cost uh, to join the relay. And because you're connected to the relays that are clean, uh, 
uh, and uh, that's why you will receive the messages that are not from bots. Mm. To kind of give it a bit of an analogy, I almost like to think like, say if you're a scammer and Twitter, for example, didn't exist, you would have to either call everyone individually or drive to everyone's house. Um, and let's say you're calling, it costs you a bit of money to do the calls. There's, ba- there's friction, essentially, in order to communicate with someone, in order to scam them. However, when you have Twitter or any of these social medias, it's free to create an account. All you need is a bit of Wi-Fi connection. So you can create hundreds of bots who then send hundreds of messages to hundreds of people, all trying to scam them. And so one thing that's when this basically this idea is essentially if you create a little bit of friction so okay it costs 5p to create an account or 10p although that's nothing to you and me if you're someone who's creating thousands of these bots that cost is all of a sudden going to add up and you will no longer create thousands of bots maybe you might try and do feel like you're not going to completely get rid of scammers but you basically make it a lot less profitable to be a scammer and hence reduce the amount of bots that are, which is kind of what it sounds like is going on on Nostra. Uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, kind of the idea. I would say the only thing that currently is happening because it's uh, still building there and the experiences, there are uh, something that are not what we are used to uh, because uh, um, Facebook was since 2004, even though now, uh, I don't know who likes it, <laughs> but uh, let's say Twitter. So uh, just on the design and the experience side, it's not the same experience uh, in some of those clients yet. But uh, uh, one important thing also is that right now, if you decide to build on top of Noster, you will not have to add any marketing budget again so you can have millions of users. Uh, right now, all the clients, because they're connected on the protocol level, if you decide to build another client, you're directly using 100% of the users that are using it. Yeah, you just have to provide this client uh, to be available and say, oh, uh, please try it. And if the experience is good, people will start using it. But in, in the current uh, application and sending messages, you, not only that you have to uh, build a great experience, but uh, you start from zero subscribers in the application, zero downloads. With Noster, right now, I think uh, it's approaching a million users. And uh, let's say one application uh, hits it uh, very well and people start liking it. Uh, now it's going to add additional 2 million users and it's not going to go down. <laughs> That's the whole thing. Uh, so, yeah, it's again exponential curve of adoption there. But I would say all those things that we're talking about, this is just barely scratching the surface of what's even possible uh, with the Lightning Network and what Bitcoin facilitates. Hmm. There's one kind of thing with Nostra that um, I, I'm, I'm curious as to how it plays out in that. There is obviously friction. There's a bit of friction to get on the platform and to actually start using it. And one thing that I think I've started to realize is that most people don't care about, as you say, being decentralized. They just want something simple yeah. and easy to use. So even if, say, NOST is an option, if I know you can create a Twitter account and just use your Gmail account to log in, although it's more centralized, um, although it's more... Although it's more centralized, it's it's easier for people, and so they're just going to do it because at the end of the day, people want things easy. Yeah. So, what do you think is going to create the incentive for, say, the larger, or say, let's talk about mass adoption, the larger by the larger population, <laughs> um, the larger population actually coming onto the platform, creating accounts. Do you think there's a risk that that just never happens and people just kind of stay on the centralized um, platforms? Uh, I don't think uh, that's uh, ever going to reverse. Uh, once you release the genie out of the box, <laughs> it's already out. It's never getting back in. And uh, I would say uh, that uh, just the clients, that's their responsibility. 
to make the experience like what we are used to right now. But for all the people that are not willing to pay that extra effort right now to accumulate connections, uh, let's say in five years, will be you just miss a lot of opportunity to create a big network. And it will still be available. It will still be uh, much better than what it is uh, today. But because uh, just like the Lightning Network, what we talked about, if one company adds additional liquidity, everybody benefits. Uh, right now, this is the same in Nostal. If somebody creates something, uh, it adds uh, to everybody in, in the network. And uh, uh, I was going somewhere with this. Uh, of the messages, I'm sorry, interlude. Messages, uh -huh. adoption, <laughs> yeah. people using it, clients having to have the yeah. duty to make it easier for us to go on, uh, um, getting yeah, there early yeah. so it's less work. To yeah, kind of yeah. Build the uh, about the early. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is kind of the cost, uh, really, uh, that effort. Uh, and uh, once you get into it, even though it's a bit harder right now, uh, it's just the development is happening so fast. I'm, I mean, extremely fast. Uh, and if one client creates something, everybody else uh, very fast copies it. And uh, since December, uh, I think three times a day, there is some type of an update uh, in one client. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, and I just love the experience, not only to receive sets, but let's say I post uh, one meme or uh, part of a uh, podcast that I appear or whatever I like to. And uh, for those people, send me some sets. That's ex uh, amazing. But it's also so cool that I'm sending sets to things that I really like. And from time to time, I receive sets for things that I don't even know they're, wh where they are coming from. <laughs> but somebody, I provided some value to them and uh, they send you things. Imagine uh, what's going to happen if uh, we onboard Africa about this. Because one dollar, what we transacted here, it was the value in our lives. Uh, but imagine if uh, there are some memes in Africa that become uh, streamlined. Uh, we're going to transfer a uh, small value the, uh, for us, but it will, um, I would say, raise the standard in Africa immensely. And it's almost you could theoretically kind of supercharge charity in that you can literally send your money instead of having to go through a big charity, this kind of stuff, you don't really know what happens with your money. You can speak with people in Africa, you can see what they're doing, you can, like if you're a project, um, kind of setting some up, you can make a Nostra account and people can send money directly to the account of that project to start supporting people. And then you can stay up to date from them. You can see people tweet, well, Nostering <laughs> about it <laughs> instead yeah. of relying on new sources from once again, a bigger institution where you're not actually sure where your money is directly going. Yeah. And you know that the money are there. Right now, I don't have to... Uh, ask my bank, uh, did you receive the 3,000 Satoshis? <laughs> They're just there in a second and uh, it's yours to do whatever you like with them. And uh, uh, when you don't go deep into uh, why Bitcoin is the only thing that's uh, possible not only to do this, but it's unstoppable, uh, before you get to that point, I would say to everybody, just continue learning. You're not there yet. It's just like saying uh, the, the gravity of the Earth is 9.7. Even if I don't accept this, there is a way to prove it. <laughs> so continue learning about Bitcoin. And once that hits you, you will say, OK, I need uh, a lot of Bitcoin. I need to transfer everything there. Uh, but yeah. And kind of you, you mentioned learning there. I thought a nice way to kind of slowly wrap up on what has been a fascinating conversation with the most interesting professional foosball player <laughs> I've met. <laughs> Could you touch on how people can go about learning about Nostra and actually partaking? Because I know that that's one thing, I mean, I found it a bit confusing to start with as well. You're like, 
what the hell is this? Like, what, what do I have to make an account? All this kind of stuff. Do you have, is there, would you say there's a good way to kind of go about learning, maybe downloading the app? Or would you say just throw yourself at it, hop onto YouTube and just go from there? Uh, yeah, I would say uh, our favorite uh, tutorial guy, BTC Sessions, has two uh, tutorials about Noster. One is about demos. Uh, and this is a client that's on iOS. And uh, he also has one other tutorial about Astro, which is another client for web. So you can see on the, the laptop or the PC, whatever you're using. And uh, start there. But uh, once you get in it, uh, connect to anybody there and uh, ask the questions there, everybody is helpful. It's full of Bitcoiners. So the conversations that happen there are genuine and it's with real people. Uh, I even listened to a, a Preston Pish podcast uh, once and he said, I posted in Twitter uh, about a particular guest so uh, his viewers could ask uh, questions that he's going to ask in the podcast. And he said in Twitter, uh, he has 400,000 followers, something like that. And uh, there, the engagement was almost zero. Uh, once you put, uh, he put that uh, in uh, Noster, like in the first five minutes, <laughs> like he was bombarded with questions because you're connected to real people and it's not even uh, being able to uh, censor by the platform. And this is what's happening in the background of all those applications. Uh, let's say because uh, he's talking about Bitcoin and he's talking about Monster and that's why the algorithm is blocking him. And that's why out of those 400,000 uh, followers, he is receiving uh, a little bit um, because they are actively blocking it. In the other platform, everybody that uh, saw that message can respond. So that is it. You're just connected to people and the engagement is huge. So uh, just jump into it. Uh, see that tutorial that BTC Sessions does. And uh, once you get in it, uh, I would say, I think in the next six to nine months, I would not be using any other platform. I already surpassed my followers uh, in Twitter, um, but uh, I, I'm not a big Twitter user. I started using it last year, but uh, it was very hard. In Noster, I just connect to people and I post them. Not only that they follow me and they like it, but they send me money. Why would I go somewhere <laughs> else when that thing exceeds 10x? That sounds, yeah, that's 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 crazy. I'm, I'm going to have to get more more involved after speaking to you about this and closing up then do you have any kind of final thoughts or things that you would like to to leave the listener uh, i would i would say this uh, uh why uh, i am right now in breeze and uh, once i figured out bitcoin uh, like we talked in the beginning, Bitcoin, uh, I felt hope because uh, after my story, especially uh, 2014 to 2017 was, was the hardest period. And I was thinking, what is the hope there? And I really, truly, genuinely uh, went through the, okay, Bitcoin is hope. But uh, once you uh, figure out, I don't need to be hopeful anymore. And what I said, all those kinds of things, I know that all my Bitcoin is my Bitcoin. And I set up those policies and believe me, once uh, once your mother is killed because of money, uh, you, your relationship with uh, protecting that money and that legacy is completely different. And for all those people that are not there yet, I would say go learn. Go learn because it is the most important thing about uh, your legacy uh, secondary. The first thing is your kids and your heirs. The second thing is uh, your Bitcoin, how you're going to pass it on properly and the way that you want it to be. So definitely learn and prove. Don't trust me. Don't trust anybody. But it's mathematically proven why it's the only thing. And once you get to that point, 
then uh, decide your actions, what you're going to do with that knowledge. And you will be transformed. The goodness in you will finally have ability to shine because how many brilliant people are in Africa, sorry, how many brilliant people are in Africa, but because they're struggling to survive with the humanity doesn't have access to those talents. And how much are we are out on that front? That thing is even unmeasurable. But that's my final message. Learn more about Bitcoin. Believe me, if you think you know, go deeper. I'm constantly learning. I, I think that I'll never stop learning about Bitcoin. I love that. Great message. It's been an, an absolute pleasure digging into all this with you. And uh, thank you for coming and sharing your story and being so open. Thank you for having me. All right. See you, Ivan. See you. Bye.